morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's too it's good to have a beautiful, beautiful day. I see the, up up north of us it was bad yesterday. Up in Georgia and up in that area where, where I come from, we had some thunderstorms and some really bad weather. Where I'm thankful that we've got a beautiful day here to enjoy it. And uh, we're uh, I think I'm gonna start with a prayer this morning and then we'll go in and have two songs. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Father, we just come to you today thanking you, Lord, and praising you for all the mighty works of your hand, Lord. You've given us such a beautiful day today, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for our loved ones that are wherever they are today. We pray you bless bless them special. And Lord, we lift up our nation and leaders of all our authority. Our country is in a lot of trouble, Lord. And we Pray somehow you'll help us, Lord, to get back to our Constitution, back to your word that it's founded on. We pray, Lord, for those that are trying to, to, to do the right thing and help us, Lord. And we pray against those, Lord, that are not doing what they should, that should be doing. We pray for our, those, Lord, that may need help, that are sick, having trouble, Lord, and their families. We lift them all up special to you today, Lord. Thank you for loving us and watching over us. We pray for a good service today. We thank you for Brother Dominic and his family and Miss Carol and Rob and Miss Glenda and all those Lord that try to help us with the services, Lord. We pray you bless a special day and we thank you for all that you do. Be with us now as we go into this service in Jesus' name we pray. If y'all uh, grab your book and let's turn to number 348. 348. Uh, I'm sorry, 248, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> 248, you understand? Let's sing all three verses. Jesus. 
That's good because she wasn't really sure the last that I talked with yeah. her whether the doctor would see her again. So let's pray for Bobby, Barbie and uh, ask the Lord to just be with her for whatever day it is that she does have the surgery. Uh, we, we have those prayers for her and pray that it will allow her to be able to walk much better because she's been very struggling really hard to, to walk. If anybody didn't attend Bible study on Tuesday night, you missed a great Bible study. And uh, you know the saying that the Lord says, where two or more are gathered together? Well, there were three of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was a great Bible study, and we are finishing this next Wednesday night at 6 o'clock here at the church. We are finishing the whole series of Jesus parables of where Jesus used stories to uh, explain in plain simple language and with Pastor Dominic we've had the privilege of understanding those stories that Jesus used and amazing how many times after we've listened to them that we could apply those to our lives. But we will have one more Wednesday night of Bible study at 6 o'clock and then also we're going to take a little short break to give Pastor Dominic some time to do some Bible study and put us together another series. And as soon as he feels the Lord has prepared him, then he will give us a heads up and we will let everyone know here at the church and also on flock notes. And if there's anybody that's here that's not on our flock notes that would like to be, it comes by email. It lets you know what's going on at the church. It lets you know about our Bible study the time, uh, also uh, any little notes that we have that we want everybody to be aware of things that are going on at the church, uh, you will get that by your email. So if you would like to do that, let me know and pass your email to me and I can, can get you on our list and keep you abreast of what's going on here at the church. We asked for prayer last uh, Sunday for the board to meet. And I'll just give you just a little quick sneak preview that the Lord took very good care of us during that meeting, even though he kept us here till almost 5 o'clock. But we fed Dominic lunch, so, so it was okay that we stayed till 5 o'clock. But um, we had a, a guest come and work with uh, Rob and Nancy, and we are in the process of upgrading uh, several things here at the church some of our lighting so that we get a better uh, camera view so that our website has clear pictures of what you miss if you're not here and you go to the website to look to see for the message. Also, to, uh, that Rob and Nancy have worked very hard to start preparing us for this and we're going to have better sound for those who don't hear as well, hopefully you will be able to hear better when we get more sound out here. So just pray that we have made a good decision for the Lord to lead us in this direction and uh, go to a, an area in our church that will help people to, if you're not able to be here, keep in touch with us and also if you are here, you can hear better. So. Is there anything that anyone would like to add to our uh, our prayer list or anything in the neighborhood that you would like to uh, bring us up to date on? I got something to say. I hate it. I missed Bible study because it's in Tampa on Wednesday. I hate it when I miss it because there's so much in them that I've never heard. And I've been hearing this stuff all my life. But you can go back on missionbythesea.org yes. and listen to the last year or so because Rob and Nancy have been recording that and the, the, the stuff about the parables is well worth it. Y'all take time to sit down and listen to it. They are incredible. You might even learn a little Hebrew and a little Greek while you're at it. Because we should get that. <laughs> the Lord has blessed us tremendously because we have learned so much through our studies on, on Wednesday night. So if there is nothing else that you would like to add to our prayer list, let's go to the Lord in just a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we just lift up our prayer list to you, Lord, and you know each one of those names that's on our prayer list. You know, Lord, what, what they need, what they have to have to be 
uh, safe and well. And Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have, that we can share with our community for that prayer list to be heard. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us. We thank you for those who are in our church family, in the house of the Lord this morning. And Lord, just bless each one of us as we go into our the rest of our service and Pastor Dominic brings to us another wonderful message. These things I ask in your name. Amen. I'd like to thank Rob and Nancy for what they did to the sign out there. I hope you know Mr. Dominic. They, they, they washed that thing down and it really looks good out there. It didn't look that good for a long time. Flowers <laughs> too. Lights at night. Yes. Some lights at night. Not only, you know, other things they've been doing, but we will appreciate what, what they did about that. And the lady you were talking about was in the wreck, broke the hip, or I had that happen to me 28 years ago, April the 16th, 28 years ago, I broke my hip out of the socket. Hmm. And, you know, I got in the pool to get my legs back, and it really was a blessing in disguise, really, because I've been swimming ever since. <laughs> uh, and that really, really, Help me keep my health in pretty good shape because uh, I tell you that that's a pretty bad injury that hip deal and uh, they didn't replace the joint they just wired it back together with some little tiny wire so I was really blessed and, but y'all pray for her that's that's a, a lot of therapy to get over that it's not not easy there's been a song on my heart the last two or three weeks and. Uh, I wanted, I wanted to share it with you, and uh, this song, I'm going to give you a little background. It's, it's kind of good sometimes to know the background, what, how and why the song was, was written, and who did it, and the reason they did it. And I'm gonna, It's a little short background. The name of it is I Must Tell Jesus. Some people seem to have an endless stream of heartaches and painful experiences. Elisha Hoffman knew one such person in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. One day when Pastor Hoffman visited her, he found her extremely discouraged. When he asked her what was wrong, she unburdened herself to him, and she, as she finished, she asked, Brother Hoffman, what shall I do? What shall I do? The pastor quoted some verses from Scripture and then said, You cannot do better than to take all of your sorrows to Jesus. You must tell Jesus. And for a moment, the woman said nothing. Then her face lit up and her eyes sparkled. And she responded, yes, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. On his way home, Hoffman couldn't forget the joy on that woman's face when she said, I must tell Jesus. So as soon as he got home, he wrote the words of this gospel song, I must tell Jesus. This morning, Ms. Clint and I have an opportunity to go over with together. Usually I have to do it off the pellet because I don't have time to practice with anybody. But this morning I'd like to share this song, I Must Tell Jesus, with you. <clears throat> I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I must ask him, he will deliver. Make up my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Tempted in Christ, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, He all my cares and troubles will share. Oh, how the world to evil alludes me, oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. 
I must tell Jesus and he will help me over oh, the world the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus, Jesus alone is the only one that can bear. Uh, we're just so thankful to be here this morning and thankful for Floyd for filling in for Tom and uh, thankful for uh, visitors and guests and if this is your first time here we're just so thankful that you're here and just joined us in worship. We have something special for you because I really do believe with all of my heart that anytime you open the inspired word of God there is something special that God has for us. Uh, not special because I deliver it, or not special because it comes from this pulpit, but special because it comes from heaven. And it's God's word. It's, it's the manna come down from heaven, delivered unto men and women's hearts in such a special way. When I was going through Bible college, I, I often found myself uh, stopping occasionally in scripture out as I was reading passages and studying passages in depth. And I would find myself tearing up, I tearing up as I really just crunched in just deeper and richer into the Word of God. I really began to think about, you know, we think about God's mercy and how God is merciful to us as sinners and that He didn't have to save us. He wasn't obligated to save us at any means, but yet He sent His only begotten Son. He sacrificed His Son for sinners. They were already opposed to him and to his glory. But you know what else is a mercy? A mercy that God has given us a book that's inspired. Uh, the mercy of God and that God saying, I'm not going to leave people in a sin-cursed, wicked world without my word, without direction, without guidance, without instruction uh, to get to heaven. And I often used to just think about that, how wonderful and amazing God's mercy is and that he compiled 66 books that really is him opening his heart, bearing all, transparent with humanity, and most of all, giving us a great picture of his son as he walked and lived in this world for 33 years and went to the cross and died. That is a mercy of God to have the scripture and to know that it's infallible, to know there's no errors, no mistakes, that all of his promises will be fulfilled and we can bank our eternal destinies on that everything that has been said in scripture is going to come to pass. And so I found myself oftentimes as a young man just stopping, just, just understanding the gravity of the moment that, that what I was holding wasn't just man's words or some book that was bound in some publisher's warehouse but that it was actually God's word and I know it seems like a simple thing but I'm often struck with that that reality that, that God has given us a word and that word is true and saying that we have uh, last Sunday we started a series on the type of church that God blesses you know, we hear often about churches and how God grows a church, how God builds a church. We uh, could probably pick up books all over the place, probably could Google it and read sermons online or articles online uh, of how we can grow and develop a healthy, sound church. And you can really read that all over the Christian Landscape. There's so many of those books, but I want to submit to you today that the only book that really matters in that area is Scripture. Now, this is the blueprint. This is the sketch 
on the way that we are to operate in the church. And if we want a church that God blesses in an enormous way and in a way that impacts not only our lives, but impacts people around us, uh, we must do it according to Scripture. And so this morning, I, I want to read a, a section of verses. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 16. Very familiar set of verses. And I, hopefully I will be able to get through uh, some of these verses uh, before you stop listening. Um, so that's always the goal of preaching is to stop before you stop listening. And so uh, that's sometimes as hard as an expositor to know when to stop. In Bible college, my professor used to say, you got to know when to stop. And so that becomes a, a difficult thing, especially when you're passionate about the scripture. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not a 20, 30 minute guy. I just can't do it. I'm just clearing my throat at the end of 20 minutes. I'm, I'm just setting the scene at the end of 20 minutes. I, I don't think you can preach anything in 20 minutes. That's just my opinion. That's just my theology. Uh, but Matthew 16 I want to read from uh, verses 13 down through verse 20. We'll probably only make it through five or six verses here. But I really want to talk about the distinctive marks of God's true church. The church that is born again, the redeemed church, the church that has been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 13 of Matthew 16 says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Our Lord, we're thankful to be in your presence. We're thankful to know that you are so special and dear in our lives and that we can just give you everything that we are, surrender our wills to you, surrender our thoughts to you, surrender our life to you. Lord, you are incomparable in value. You are of infinite worth. You are the only God, the only Savior, the only one that can change and transform lives. We thank you for the church. We thank you for your constant persistence in building your church in a world that is opposed to you. We're thankful for amazing grace that places us in heaven with you in the future, that you're preparing a place for those who love you or thankful for your word that is inspired, that we can trust in it, that we can lean on it, that we can gain encouragement and comfort from it in these times that we live in. Lord, bless our time here this morning and give us entrance into your truth in a way that just doesn't fill our head with a bunch of knowledge, but in a way that impacts our hearts, our lives, and those around us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last Sunday we began this particular series in a very um, important passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 2. Verses 42 through 47 usually is the go-to passage when anytime you're dealing with the birth of the church. Uh, and one of the things that we really looked at hard last Sunday was that the birth of the first century church on the day of Pentecost was birthed under red, hot Bible preaching. 
Uh, that is the primary source that God uses to build His church, to equip His church, is the red-hot preaching of the Bible. Uh, case in point, the very first sermon that Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 souls are saved. The second sermon he preaches, nearly 5,000 people are saved. Two sermons, almost 10,000 people saved. Some theologians believe that it was probably even more than that if you're considering uh, women and children that were there. I mean, that is an enormous amount of people who are really converted. Uh, not an altar call where people come down and have this sentimental, sappy notion of who God is and repent. I mean, a real, genuine repentance, a real, genuine conversion. Two sermons preached, nearly 10,000 people are saved, and they're saved under the red-hot preaching of the apostles. And so it is, when you read the rest of the book of Acts, all you begin to see is sermon after sermon, message after message, God using the Scripture in a way that convicts people, brings them to repentance, and therefore saves them and changes them. Oh, we talked about the epicenter of the church that God will bless must be the proclamation of the gospel from the pulpit. Uh, that's one of the identifiable marks of a true church. If you're ever in an area where you're vacationing or if you're ever in an area where you're outside of your home church and trying to find a local church in the area, the first thing you need to look for is, is the pastor preaching the Word of God. Is he actually preaching out of the book? Because you can have a building full of people and have a pastor who's not preaching anything out of the book. Oh, one thing that is clear in the book of Acts is that the people who were listening to the messages and the people who were under uh, the tutelage of the apostles is that the apostles were not sappy, sentimental storytellers or jokesters. They continued to draw on Old Testament Scripture. They continued to draw out of the Psalms. They continued to draw out of the book of Zechariah and the prophets. They would preach inspired Scripture because they knew only that God would bless churches who would preach inspired Scripture. And we kind of looked at that in, in great length and great detail that biblical preaching is the engine that drives the church. It's the rudder that directs the ship. And one of the verses there in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And we talked about that word doctrine, how uh, some churches, their mantra today is doctrine divides. Don't worry about doctrine. Don't worry about teaching. Well, I want to tell you, the first century church, they were relentless and committed at understanding doctrine, at understanding what the Scripture actually taught. And that was characteristic of a newborn church that doctrine is everything to the life of the church. And it was in the book of Acts in chapter 2, we began to look throughout there, we began to see that uh, that the preaching of Peter was text-driven. That is, that he used Scripture for everything. It was God-exalting. All through his sermon, you, you, you hear the, the, the titles of the Messiah. You hear him saying the word God, the, the word the Lord Jesus Christ. It was God-exalting. It was also spirit and power. And that is, it wasn't just people were collectively compiling and to hear some dominant personality from the pulpit and it just became an event. It was actually spirit empowered where the spirit of God was speaking through the man of God, disposing the word of God into the hearts of the people. We also saw that the first sermon that Peter preached, it was theologically rich. It really it began to talk about the sovereignty of God and the predestination of God, those, those big weighty truths that people so often run from. 
Those big weighty truths that we often divide over. And the first sermon that Peter preached, he went right at it. He began to tell the people that were there, Oh, you with wicked hands, you have crucified Jesus Christ and you're culpable and you're responsible for what you have done to Jesus. But make no mistake about it, you didn't get one over on God because God had already planned the mission and the plan of redemptive history before you were ever even created. That great paradox of the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man is, is the first sermon that Peter preaches. Often today, most people won't even get close to that. They've been in the, the faith for 20, 30 years. They just don't want to deal with it. And so we saw that that first sermon was so powerful. I, I threw a phrase out there that, that I think is very important that theology or that biblical preaching is theology on fire. And that's what it is. It's the thundering and lightning of biblical preaching from the pulpit. That's the type of church that God blesses. And what that brings is it, it unifies the church. So from the pulpit, everything flows out and the church can never go uh, higher than the pulpit and what the pulpit teaches. And so what's pushing out from the biblical preaching from the pulpit is it unifies believers. It produces the attitude of real worship, sacrificial giving to one another. Unconditional love expressed towards one another, and not only towards one another, but towards people in the world. And that's what Acts chapter 2 was all about, is if, if the church can keep the pulpit as the primary source of producing every other good, righteous um, attitude in the church, then the church will do just fine. That's the only type of church that God blesses. Is a church... Where the pulpit is front and center. A side note here, when I first began to pastor at Lanark Community Church, I first walked in there by myself and I told them to give me a couple minutes in the sanctuary by myself. I walked in there and the first thing I did was said, I said, God, is this where I'm supposed to be? Because if this is not where I'm supposed to be, I don't want to be here. Oh, yes, I can get in the pulpit and preach a great message and have everybody all, all riled up and ready to vote and say, yes, put the young man in there and we want him to be the power. Oh, yeah, that's the easy part. But the part that really matters is, God, is this where you want me to be? And I'll never forget about it. I was standing in the middle of the, the aisle, which at Lanark goes a little bit further back, and I turned around and, and looked at this area, and I'll never forget it. The pulpit was actually off-center to the right. It was like over to the right, kind of jammed up next to the piano. And, and I remember almost immediately in my heart, if this church is ever going to be a church that brings honor and glory to God, the center and staple of the church Front and center must be the proclamation of the gospel. So the very next Sunday, I took my little key, went in there, unbolted the pulpit that was pushed all the way over to the right, and put it front and center. It was just a symbolic uh, emotion of that the church must be centered around the proclamation of the gospel. I got a little pushback here and there. No one felt like it was some big deal, but I really did feel like it was a big deal. I wanted people when they came through the front door to see the pulpit and understand that we preach the gospel here. The gospel is just not shoved away over there in the corner. And it's just some 15 minute little action that we do as a tack on on the service. And, you know, there's no meaning to it. No, it must be the proclamation of the gospel. And here in Matthew, I kind of want to look at a, a different perspective. There's so many passages of Scripture that talk about the life of the church and the distinctive marks of a, the true church of God. And there's a lot of views of the church out there. When I went through Bible college, I heard tons of different views of what the church is, what it's supposed to be, 
what it's supposed to look like, how it's supposed to operate, how ministers are supposed to serve in the church. And even I've even heard how pastors can build the church. And I just want to tell you <clears throat> that that notion is foolish. I will never try to compete with Christ. Uh, this verse right here, verse 18, says, I will build my church. Well, why would I ever try to compete with Christ in building his church? So when people ask me, hey, how do you think we can build the church? I, I often just say, hey, listen, we're just servants in the church that he is building. I never want to get in the way of that. But uh, let, me, let me give you some, some great truths of what the church is before we get to digging in this passage and the first one is the church is a love gift from the Father to the Son. Did you know that? That the church itself is actually a love gift from God the Father given to the Son because of His obedience to sacrifice Himself on the cross. John chapter 6, John chapter 17, both of those chapters you will begin to see verbiage like this, that the Father gave believers to the Son. The word gave. The word give. Uh, because the Father is the one who has chosen before the foundation of the world. Because the Father is the one who calls. The Father is the one who draws. The Father is the one who saves. And then He gives those believers over to the Son. And then the Son keeps and protects all the way to the last day that the Son raises all those who are believers up on the last day and then places them into heaven. We are a love gift from the Father to the Son. And I'll go a step further than that. That in the very last day, the Son will give the church right back to the Father. Oh, we are a divine love gift from God the Father to the Son because of his obedience on the cross. And we will worship forever and ever. And so the church is a love gift. But secondly, the church is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Christ, if you will. Oh, we've been rescued. If you're born again, if you're really saved, you've been rescued out of the kingdom of darkness. You've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of truth. God has brought us into a kingdom. He is our king. The church is what we call the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, not the building. You, you are the church, uh, the people. Uh, the Spirit of God inhabits us. The Spirit of God lives inside of us. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We're the stewards of divine truth. We're the ground and pillar of the truth. Like Timothy so often speaks of. And to be honest with you, the church is the best taste of heaven anybody will ever get here on earth. Did you know that? Uh, the church brings heaven down to earth. Uh, the world will never experience heaven the way that they can experience the church today. It's just a little tiny taste of what heaven will be. When you'll be around a, a rarefied people who've been changed and delivered from their sins and have been transformed. And one day we'll all be glorified together. And so the church is the best taste of heaven anybody can ever have before actually getting to heaven. The Spirit of God is in motion in our lives. We're able to demonstrate unconditional love. We're able to demonstrate unconditional mercy towards people. But number three, the, the church is the gathering of true worshipers. Those who worship God in truth and spirit. Or like John chapter 4 says, spirit and truth. We are the true worshipers of God. We encourage one another to love and good works. We, we care for one another. We love one another. We're designed to pull each other up, not destroy each other. God has empowered us and equipped us all with different gifts and different talents where we can serve each other. That's what Ephesians chapter 4 is all about. That, uh, that God has placed different 
giftings and different talents inside of the church, uh, not for ourselves, but for the, the edifying of the body, for the building up of each other. So often churches are so divided and so schismatic and they tear each other down, but the church was never designed for that. The church is the gathering of true worshipers. We are the launching point of evangelism. It's the only reason why you're even here still. Because let me tell you something. God saved you. He could have took you right to heaven. The only reason why you are still on this planet and you are born again is for one reason. And that is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. Outside of that, we could be in heaven right now, fully glorified, stepping into eternity. We are the launching point of biblical evangelism. We're designed to reach the ends of the earth. And the church is more important than any human kingdom, more important than all human organizations, more important than empires, more important than dynasties. It is more important than anything on the face of this planet because it is the only place where you can rub shoulders with people who have been touched by God and your life can be changed. Not only that, the church is incomparable in its value. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the highest price that has ever been paid on the face of this planet was paid for at the cross when Jesus gave his life. The most perfect human being that ever walked the face of this planet, never had a wrong thought, never had a wrong attitude, never displayed a sinful action, and he was crucified on a cross like a career criminal. And you know why he was crucified? To purchase you and me. And he didn't purchase us with silver and gold like Peter says, but he purchased us with his precious blood that were spilled at the cross. Incomparable value, it's the church because the blood of Jesus was spilled to redeem us. So what makes a church a real church? Well, it's obvious from verse 18 right there, that little phrase where Jesus says, I will build my church. I mean, that's really the heart of the entire text is that everything amplifies that great statement. And I do want to throw this in for people who study a little bit harder in covenant theology and dispensationalism and all of those man-made systems that are tried to apply to the Bible. Notice this is future tense. I will build my church. It's not to say that from Matthew chapter 16 all the way back to Genesis that there was never any believers that were ever saved or born again because you're saved by grace from Genesis to Revelation. You're, saying the, you're saved the exact same way in the Old Testament that you are in the New Testament that you do are saved today. Old Testament saints look forward to the promise of the Messiah. They were saved by believing in that. And we today are saved by looking back at what Jesus did on the cross. But what this is saying is that Jesus already has in mind that Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God is going to fall in such a profound way that the birth of the church, the birth of the first century church is going to play, take place in the future. And then from then on, there will be a formal spiritual organism where God will begin to compile believers all over the face of the world from every single generation and compile them in to one body of Christ which becomes the bride of Jesus. And so this little phrase knocks out the notion that the church was established in the Old Testament. The church is future. And this also tells us that only Christ can build the church. Only Christ can take dead sinners and make life there and then adopt them into a spiritual, breathing, living organism and take them, change their natures, change their disposition and make them saints of God. Only Christ can do that. 
And so we're not talking about building a building here. We're talking about building people. And we're not even talking about filling the building up with bodies in the pews because that has no idea of building the church. Building the church has to do with God building people's lives one life at a time, saving one person at a time. A building has nothing to do with it. Bodies sitting in a pew have nothing to do with it. We have to start here because I think some pastors and get a little beside themselves when they start a small church and then all of a sudden they have a mega church and they, they step back and think they built the church. Well, I'll tell you, Psalm 139 is very pointed about that. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Only God and God alone can build the church. And that's what this the heart of this text is. I will build my church. He's telling Peter that. You know why he's telling Peter that? Because the Lord already knows that Peter is going to have great success in his first two sermons. And Jesus already knows exactly the process that Peter is about to go through. Uh, the process is, Peter, you're going to deny me. You're going to think everything has failed. You're going to think that you have just shamed everybody, and especially me. You're going to go out there and you're going to you know, walk away sad. You're going to walk away defeated. You're going to go back to trying to fish. You're going to try to go back to your profession and your profession is not going to work because I've called you to proclaim the gospel. I'm going to encourage you in John chapter 21. I'm going to restore you, bring you back, and then you're going to step into the book of Acts and you're going to be red hot on fire for me. And you're going to preach two sermons and thousands of people are going to be saved. But you need to remember this one conversation that we had is going to be me building the church, not you. Now, this is a much needed talk here. This is much needed for Peter to get this in his mind. I can only imagine if a pastor stood up and preached two sermons nowadays and 8,000 people were saved, he would probably be on TVN and CNN and ABC and Fox the very next day. Oh, I'm building the church. Mega church here. <laughs> Peter, you need to understand that it's me building the church. That's what the Lord is communicating in this as he's also teaching them. How do we know a true church? Let's start looking in verse 13. We'll start picking this apart a little bit. A true church is, number one, known by a great confession. A church has to have a great confession. Uh, verse 13, uh, Jesus comes into the coast of Caesarea Philippi and he asks the disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man? And this, this is a general, uh, this is the Lord conversing with his disciples and he's saying, what is everybody else saying about me? Ah, just give it to me straight. What is the rest of the people saying about me? Not that Jesus cared, but that Jesus really wants to teach them a very important principle here about what supreme confessions are. And they said, you know, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah. Others say you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And notice that Jesus doesn't respond to any of those ideas. You know what he does? He goes straight to the heart. He goes straight to the disciples because that's really where he was trying to go in the beginning. And then he turns his gaze from worrying about what the rest of the people are saying about him. And he wants to make sure before he goes any further that his disciples know exactly who he is. Because on the shoulders of the disciples will be the growth and the production and the soundness of the church in the book of Acts. He wants to know that they know who he is. And the reason why is because every great church, any true church, any church that God blesses, must have a great profession of faith of who Jesus is. You know, I've talked to tons of people in the church about the deity of Christ. 
you would be astounded to know how many people I talk to in the church that don't even believe Jesus Christ is God. And you cannot believe, you cannot believe that and be saved. Let me tell you as clear as it can be. If you have the notion in your mind that Jesus is just a good person, Jesus is just some great model for religion or some spiritual guru or some people, some guy that just popped down out of heaven and he's just a good man like every other prophet in the Bible, there is no way you've been saved. I'll say that as graciously as I can. If you do not have the supreme confession of faith that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, you are not saved. That is first and foremost. Now the church that God builds, the true church, the first distinguishing mark of the true church is that believers have the same confession of faith. He looks right at his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? Do you know that's the greatest question of all questions? You know, you can get every other question on the face of this planet right, and if you miss that one, you miss heaven. And you can get that one question right and miss every other question that's important in the world and still go to heaven. I mean, this is the greatest question of all questions, right? This is the one that people have to answer. This is the one that everyone will eventually answer. And they'll bow one way or the other. They'll confess one way or the other. Philippians 2 tells us that. At the end of time, everyone will bow. Some will bow to judgment and some will bow to salvation. And so here Jesus says, Peter, who do you say that I am? And in verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, uh, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God, you're the Messiah. You're the anointed one, you're, you're Christos, Huios. You're, you, you are the one that was already pre-planned to come into the world. You're the one that came before John the Baptist. You're the one that has been prophesied to come. You're Messiah. It's pretty easy to see. We're 16 chapters into the book of Matthew and they've already seen the likes of miracles and every other thing. This is a confession that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the foundation of the church. Not, not some personal experience with the Jesus of your own imagination. Not some personal experience where you've crafted your own idea of who you think God is. The church is built on this confession alone. I want to draw you into the word living. Very interesting that Peter would even mention that word because you don't see it anywhere else in Scripture. We understand the truth is a reality. But I mean, Peter could have said, you know what? You're the Christ. Uh, you're the Son of God. You're the one in whom we've been looking for. But it's very interesting to note that he says you are the Son of the living God. And that's very important contextually because where they're at right now, they're in the district of Caesarea Philippi. And this particular district, this particular area actually is one of the most highly pagan areas in this area that they're in. And a matter of fact, it used to be designated to uh, this uh, uh, mythology, this God uh, whose name was the God of Pan. And he supposedly was born in a cave. And, and this mythical God Pan who was born in the cave where they're at in this particular area was one to be worshipped. And everyone used to come from all sides of the earth. They would come to this cave and they would give their great respects to this mythical God named Pan. And then what happened over the centuries and when you get to the time of Christ this particular area in Caesarea Philippi actually became so pagan that they had multiple gods in that area and people would come from all over 
the place and it would be just like a melting pot of pagans who would come and worship their each individual gods. And so when Rome took over, they said, hold on for a second. You can worship whatever God you want. We don't care. But we're going to rename the place Caesarea Philippi in honor of Caesar Augustus. Because he's the only one around here that needs to be worshipped. And so Rome renamed the area, but the area still held all the pagan gods. And, and what Caesar did is he built a statue to himself right next to the cave. So if you were coming for years and years to worship your gods, the first thing that you would see when you came up to this cave in this area was this enormous statue of Caesar because he felt like he was deity and he should be worshipped too. And what's very interesting is that all of those false gods are dead gods. And it's very striking that Jesus would use this particular time and this particular place, knowing the history and the background of this particular area. And Peter was probably looking around at all of the false god paraphernalia and everything else. And he was probably looking around and said, you're asking me who you are? Well, I'll tell you one thing. You're not, you're not a dead god. You are the son of the living God. And that's important because the church is founded off of the reality that our God is alive, that he's not dead, that we can't create God. We can't make God. Isaiah chapter 44, it talks about how idols are made and how the nation of Israel got so enamored in worshiping other gods that they would literally go out into the forest and cut a tree down and they would carve out of the trunk of a tree their God and they would worship that God. And then when wintertime came about, they'd take that God, throw them into the fire so the, 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 that particular wood would warm them. And the whole notion of that is just insane. How are you going to worship a God that you made? Right? Those are dead gods, dead idols. Our God is alive. He's always been alive. He's not Buddha. He's not Muhammad. He's not any other false prophet that has ever came along in human history. I want to tell you, they're still in the grave. And they never came out of the grave. There's only been one that has come out of the grave with all full power and authority in his hands, and his name is Christ. He is the son of the living God. How can you make your own God? That's insanity. Worship the God that you made half of the year, and the other half of the year, you throw him in the fire. Does it make any sense? Isaiah 44 also talks about how the the ironer, the, the guy, the smith, how he goes and gets metal and makes a god out of metal and then, and then uses that metal in a war or in a fight. Like half the year you worship it, the other half you use it as a weapon. It makes no sense at all. I want to tell you this confession that Jesus, that Peter has just stated, it's not an optional view. It's not optional. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, you have to believe this. There, there's no other option. It's so foundational to the church and in theology and Bible college. It's Christology is the subject. That's the study of Christ. One of the very first things that you go into in Bible college, a, a good Bible college. I mean, the Moody Bible Institute, you could have went in a bunch of different directions, but they make you take Christology right out of the gate. The reason why is because they know that there will be unsaved people who apply in the Bible colleges, and they want to make sure you know who Christ is before you even get started. I, I think my Christology class was almost seven months long. I, there was times where I thought in my mind, I was like, God, I know who Christ is. I want to get a little further here. 
I mean, they, everything about Christ, who is Christ? We understand the scripture is clear that he is God in flesh. All true believers say the same thing. They have a common confession about who Christ is. And that's what was going on here. The true church has to start here with this confession. The church is built on this confession. But not only that, not only a great confession, verse 17, every true church has a great communication is what we'll call it. And notice right here in verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not what? Revealed it unto thee. The it is the divine revelation of the truth of the person of Jesus Christ. I just want to take a side note here. You know how I am with this. Once again, the sovereignty of God displayed even in communicating spiritual knowledge to the heart. Uh, notice that Peter doesn't say, oh, yippee, I got this all on my own. He doesn't say that, does he? See, when you start really reading scripture, that sovereignty of God thing starts coming up a lot. Uh, we're just so scared to handle the subject because we feel like it divides so much. And I want to tell you, the minute that you really stabilize in your heart the sovereignty of God, and that is that God is in complete control of everything that occurs and nothing is outside of his grasp, and the world is not just spinning in a way that the world wants it to spin, but everything is being unfolded just the way it's already been planned. And whatever his purpose is, we trust him for that. And then God and God alone is the only one that can awaken the dead heart to spiritual truth. Because that's what Peter just said. That's what Jesus just said. Once again, you know what Jesus is doing? He's drawing Peter back in because guess what? I know this two sermons you're about to preach. You're about to wow the whole city. I mean, you're about to be Billy Graham times a million. <laughs> and there's two things I want you to know before you get the big head, Peter, because you're known to get the big head. You're known to step out on the water and get the big head, Peter. I mean, you're known to put your foot in your mouth. You've done it plenty of times. I already knew you before you even created in your mother's womb, Peter, and that's why I love you. And what God, what Christ wants Peter to know here in this passage is, A, number one, I am the one building the church. And number two, the confession that's in your heart, the reality of the truth of who I am, you didn't figure it out on your own. I'm the one that gave it to you. That's got to be humbling for Peter. Peter's probably stepping back at this point saying, why is a lot of stuff going on right here? Is there something that I'm supposed to be doing in the future here? You know what this truth communicates? That it's only God and God alone that can reveal spiritual truth. I, I know I say that and I, I know you might believe that, but do you really understand what that really means? That means you can't figure it out. <laughs> that means it doesn't matter how many Bible colleges you go to, how many language studies you take, how many preachers you listen to, how many books you read, how many devotions you do, how many YouTube pastors you hear. If God does not reveal truths in the heart, you can't get it. That's a hard truth, isn't it? The marks of a true church, the church that God builds, is not only built on the solid foundation of a great confession that Jesus is the Son of the living God, it is also built on the distinctive truth that is God and God alone who reveals that truth. That's what the word reveal right there means. It's the word apocalypto. It means to disclose. It means to uncover. It means that God stepped out of eternity in the person of Jesus Christ and he stepped out into the light and made himself visible to man. And that is that man could never initiate a saving relationship with God. Sinful man could never reach up his hand to a holy God. A holy God must reach down to sinful man. 
And he did that through the person of Jesus Christ and the mediation of the cross. Man doesn't have the spiritual ability or power to reach up to holy God because the only thing that man should get is judgment from God. It's in God's mercy. And so the Father reveals divine truth. It's not flesh and blood. It's real simple here. Not flesh and blood. It's not because of Peter. It's because of God. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me show you a couple little verses here. As we continue to move through this great communication of the truth of who Christ is. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2, drop down to verse 9. A very little, a powerful little set of verses that Paul is communicating here. In verse 9 of chapter 2, it says, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor heard, ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared, prepared for them that love him. But God has, there's the word revealed, apocalypto, same word that Jesus uses in Matthew. But God has revealed, you ought to underline that. Them, them referring to what's going on in verse 9, those, the things which God has prepared unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all the things, yea, the deep things of God, for what man knows the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. God, let me stop right there. Uh, what Paul is going through is the contrast between a spiritual person and a natural person, between a born again person and someone who's not born again. And what Paul is saying is that the spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, takes all of the deep, rich truths from God Himself. He takes those truths. He searches out the truths from the first person of the Trinity, takes all of those truths, and takes those truths and reveals those truths to the hearts and minds of believers. That's the only way that you're ever even able to understand divine truth. It's the Spirit of God who reveals that truth. And it's not, not the ministry of the Spirit of God. When Jesus told His disciples, hey, I need to leave because if I don't leave, the Spirit of God will not come back. The Comforter will not come back. A.K.A. the Spirit of Truth. That's the ministry of the Spirit of God. And Jesus is in heaven. The Spirit of God resides in our hearts and teaches us divine truth. There's no other way that we can understand divine truth. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak. Now he's referring to scriptural truth, which man's wisdom teaches, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Watch verse 14. But the natural man, that's the man that's not saved, the man that's not born again, the man that has a darkened understanding, darkened heart receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness unto them. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, what Paul is saying is there that, is that God's truth is not even humanly discoverable. It's not humanly discoverable. That it takes the act of God to disclose his truth to the human heart. Man in his sinful condition cannot understand biblical truth. The Spirit of God has to take that wisdom and apply it to the heart. And that's what you're getting in Matthew 16, where Jesus is saying, pump the brakes, Peter. You didn't figure this out on your own. Oh, you're a fisherman anyway, right? You didn't go to Hebrew school. You didn't take Old Testament theology. You weren't an aspiring Pharisee or you weren't an aspiring religious person. Because guess what? All of those people think they got it and what they really have is man's wisdom. 
And the Lord is saying, that guess what? The marks of a true church is where God communicates and reveals divine truth to the hearts of the hearers. And what we have today is the scripture. That's our biblical truth. Uh, the spirit of God, and I've said this many times, and I don't want you to miss this, but my only job as a pastor, and well, I've many jobs, but my primary job is what we call biblical fidelity. You know, my job is not to get you to respond to the gospel because I can't possibly do that. Because you responding to the gospel is a spiritual work. You know, the only thing that I can do is be faithful to the text, be faithful in my prayer time, be faithful in, in being relentless and committed to, to divine truth, so much so that I just put everything I have into studying and praying and seeking God's faith and seeking God's direction in the church, and then I can get in the pulpit, open up the scripture, and begin to communicate divine truth. But I can only reach your physical hearing. The Spirit of God must take it from your physical hearing down to your heart. I cannot go there. I don't have the power to do it. I'm a mere man just like you. So my only job is, is to dispense spiritual truth, divine truth, uh, be biblically faithful to my study time and my prayer time and be sensitive to the Spirit of God and preach it and herald it and throw it out like the sower sowing the seed and the Spirit of God has to take that and drive it right into your heart. I can't do that. And any pastor and preacher that thinks he can, he has just played Junior Holy Ghost. He has. He has. And you know what? I'm able to sleep good at night when I know that. I'm able to sleep good at night when I know what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Corinthians. And here it is. One plants. One waters. What's the next phrase? But God gives the increase. I'm so glad I'm not responsible for that part. Because if I was, I'd be in a loony bin. Because every person that I've ever tried to witness to, most of them, I don't want to have anything to do with the gospel. You want to know why? Because it's foolishness unto them. Unless God opens the heart, man will never know. I don't want to tell you if you're sitting here today and you're not saved, I'm giving you truth. I'm giving you truth that can open your heart. But it's God's spirit that must ultimately convict you and drive you to repentance. It's not because of a dominant personality standing in a pulpit or an orator or, or any type of Bible degrees. Because all of that stuff is out of the window when you're dealing with the spirit of God. He took fishermen and turned the world upside down. Back to Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is teaching Peter that, hey, this revelation of who I am, it, it doesn't happen by flesh and blood. And that is that God the Father is the source. And Peter doesn't figure it out on his own. You know, I've oftentimes, and I'll be honest with you, when I did prison ministry really hard the first couple of years, and I remember going in there, and I, I remember having, you know, 150, 200 people in there, and, and, and having a great sermon put together, a sermon that I felt like, you know, was needed inside the prison system, which mainly, to be honest with you, is just all gospel preparation, all gospel, gospel, gospel. And I remember times where I had 10, 11, 12 pages of notes, and I stepped in there, and I opened up the scripture, and literally in the middle of the sermon, I could just, just feel an impression in my heart that I needed to stay in a set of verses, that I needed to communicate a little bit more out of a different set of verses. And I would have two or three pages of notes over here and I'd have a couple little verses over here. And I often find that when you're open to the Spirit of God when you preach, and I'm by no way saying you don't need to study because I don't believe in that. Oh, the pastor just started driving to the church and God showed up in his car before he got to church and said, I don't want you preaching that, I want you preaching this. That's retarded. And you've heard that before, haven't you? You just turn on TV and they'll do it all the time. 
And you know what they do is they fight against the pastors who do have notes and who do study and who are diligent. Well, hey, I got news for you, Mr. TBN. The scripture says, study the scripture to so yourself approved. That's what it says. says study the scripture. That's our job is to study, to do word definitions, to do geographical contextual stuff and to, to see, to, to recreate the scene so we can get the right context, therefore knowing the truth of what was said when it was written, not just say whatever we think it says. God the Father is the source of divine truth. And so I think that's really important here. There's a whole lot of truth from Genesis to Revelation that talks about Christ. The whole book is about Christ. The Old Testament is the anticipation that Christ is going to come. And when he comes and he dies on the cross. And then everything after that is an explanation of who he is. That's what you get with the letters of Paul. You get Paul in an intricate theological way in all of his books in Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. All those books where, where Paul is explaining who Christ is. Because the true church is built on this great confession of who Christ is and this great reality that only God can reveal that spiritual reality to people's hearts. But not only that, I want to show you that a true church is known by a great conflict. And we'll just spend a couple minutes here and we'll close. But you see in verse 18, it says, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter upon this rock. And we'll go into what that means next Sunday. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know what one of the identifiable marks of the real church of God? Great conflict. You know, we often, because we're in the West, we don't think about the martyrs and people who actually give their lives for this every single day. You know, I just want to tell you, there's been so much blood spilled over the church for centuries and centuries and centuries. As a matter of fact, the old Puritans used to say that the church was birthed out of the blood of martyrs. And once again, there's a mercy of God, what I mentioned before. You know, we're at where we're at with the church because people gave their lives for this thing. You know, that's one of the reasons why we have the Bible in written form today. There were people like Martin Luther who were willing to translate to go against an entire Roman Catholic system to be ostracized because he wanted to translate the Bible in the common tongue so the people could have the truth for themselves. Other martyrs that gave their lives, that were killed, that we might have this. I mean, if you look at church history, you study church history, I mean, there's been millions and millions of Christians who've died and spilled their blood for the church. The church was born in great conflict. And you'll always see great conflict. You know what you see today? Great conflict beginning to happen over here in the West. Close the churches down. What's the reason? COVID. Now they're all of a sudden they're concerned about the health of everybody in the world. But that translates into close the church. Don't close Walmart. Close the church. I don't have to chase that rabbit. You know who we're at. But the true church, what marks the true church is the true church will always be attacked. In every generation, in every century, the real church will be attacked. And what Jesus is giving Peter here, once again, is a promise. Because Peter's going to need this promise in the book of Acts. Because you know what Peter's going to start seeing in the book of Acts? Martyr after martyr after martyr after martyr giving their lives for the faith. Uh, Peter's about to hear about Stephen who is about to be murdered by Saul who becomes Paul. So Peter needs to know that, hey, guess what? I'm going to the cross. I'm about to die, which they still haven't got. I'm leaving y'all here on this earth. But there's a couple things you need to know. I'm going to build my church. God is the one that's going to reveal the truth that will build my church. And the third thing is, guess what? The gates of hell will never prevail. I will always build my church. So even in those days where the 
Attendance looks small. Even in those days where we've only got three in Bible study, you just know that I am still building my church despite what it looks like. Not building a building, not putting bodies in the pews, but I am collectively in a universal way saving sinners and adding them into a spiritual organism. I'm compiling a people that will be in heaven that will worship me forever. That's a promise. That's a promise that I will build my church. And I want to tell you, I have to bring myself back to that at times and say, you know what? No matter what it looks like, Lord, I know you're doing what you're doing. I'll leave you this little nugget here. When Peter starts here, I mean, this is a lot for one man to handle. I mean, he's still young. Like, this is a, he's still a young believer. Only 16 chapters in the Gospel of Matthew. I mean, I mean it was just Matthew chapter 3 and chapter 4 that he just called them. I mean, he just walked by the seaside and said, hey, y'all over there. I know you got a fishing business. I know you got your fathers there and you got all, you know, your income, your livelihood is going toward fishing, but I can make you a better fisherman. You want to follow me? And oh, by the way, it's not going to be real fish. It's going to be people for the kingdom of God. You think you want to follow me? The scripture says in Matthew 4 that they immediately left their nets. I mean, they have left everything for Christ. They've left their family. They're pretty much ostracized in their own land because they're identifying with what the Jews think is a false Messiah. And now you know what Jesus is about to do in verse 22? He's about to drop a big bomb on them. Actually, verse 21. Right after Jesus gives Peter the truth of how the church is going to be built, that he is going to do it no matter what. Verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Verse 20, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, be it far from thee, Lord. This, do you know what just occurred there? Peter just grabbed God. Peter has no clue what he's doing because Peter has just heard from Jesus. I am fixing to leave now, Peter. Uh, this boat is the sailing. I was only destined to be here for a short period of time. I know you left everything. I know you've been following me. I know you gave up a lot to follow me. But guess what? I am about to leave you. What? I left everything for this. You know what Peter does? Grabs hold. In the original language, Peter grabs Jesus. Could you imagine that? The creator grabbing the creature, grabbing the creator of the universe and then rebuking him? You know why we identify with Peter so much? Because he can go from the mountaintop all the way right back down in the valley just that quick. I mean, didn't, wasn't he the one that got the A-plus on the test on who Jesus is? Oh, was it just, I mean, verses prior to this, Peter said, yeah, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Man, Peter, you nailed that one on the test. You got it. And I mean, we're six, seven verses later. Now he's grabbing Christ. And you want to know why? Because the picture's not clear to Peter right now. He doesn't know how the collective parts are going to fit together in his life. And he doesn't even know how God's about to actually use him in a mighty, powerful way. And Christ is telling Peter, I'm still going to build my church. You just follow my lead. Take your hands off me. <laughs> you lost your mind? <laughs> you know who I am? <laughs> I know what you're about to do. You're about to deny me. But I won't deny you. You know the goodness of God. And despite our 
our bouts with the flesh at times. We're so spiritual some moments, so fleshly other moments. And we hate to be so fleshly. We, we have that inner tension like Paul describes in Romans chapter 7 and how there's things that he wants to do, but he really can't do them because his flesh is always getting in the way. You know, the mercy of God is that even in our bouts of our flesh, even when we deny him, maybe with actions, you know, he's always there. He's always been there. He always will be there for his people. And Peter doesn't understand that yet. And you know what I've often seen is the people who God saves in the bottom of the bucket usually become the people that are so on fire for God that you can't stop them. It's like the verses in the Gospels. Well, when you're forgiven much, you love much. There's just a different degree there when you have thankfulness built up into your heart for where God's brought you. You know, in my bouts in the and everybody knows this, not ashamed of it. My bouts of 17 years in the prison system. I used to hear it all the time because I wasn't raised in a Christian church and wasn't raised about a God, around a godly family. And people thought I had a spurious conversion when I was 20 years old. And I used to hear it all the time. I used to hear it every year. Oh, you'll fizzle out. <laughs> oh, you'll fizzle out. You're just doing this because you're in prison. And you're just doing this because it's just a jailhouse religion. And I used to hear it year after year after year after year after year. I'd hear it. Even people in my own family used to say it. And I'd just be looking at the clock and say, yeah, five years have gone by, still doing it. <laughs> Ten years have gone by, still doing it. Fifteen years gone by, still. And, you know, the big test is, oh, when he gets out. Uh, let's see if he brings the Bible out with him. Because it's, it's a common occurrence when people leave the prison system that there's a trash can that's right outside the gate and most people take the Bible and throw it right in the trash can because they've used God for all they can use it for. And then the first year I was out, they were like, well, maybe he'll last a little bit. I had news for them. I'm not lasting because it's me. I'm lasting because it's him. The mercy of God, even in our lives, but we sometimes overlook so small things that will push you into a place where you have his presence even more deeper and richer. Yeah, we, we love Peter because he's all over the place. But I love Peter because of how he responds. And he responds in a way in Acts chapter 2 where he just stands up and he lets loose. Beloved, we, we got a lot of churches that say they're churches, but they think that they're churches because they have a building or a steeple, or because they have a choir or hymnals in the pews, or people who are good at quoting verses or dropping money in the plate or holding their Bible a certain way or adjusting their tie in a certain way. I want to tell you, Oh, it makes the church a church. It's you and me. Elementary, simple to understand. With that, let us close. Lord, we, we're so thankful for your word. And the way, oftentimes, Lord, we, we don't read it the way we should. It sits on a shelf. It sits on a table. It, it sits wherever it sits. We glance at it through our daily activities. We're convicted to read it, but yet we shrug that small, still voice off. What could be more important on the face of this planet than the topic of God? You've always loved us. You can love us no more than you love us today. Your love is pure, it's perfect. It's holy in every way. And we're thankful for it. We're thankful for forgiving us of our sins in an eternal way 
who are justified in your eyesight, never to be condemned because of your perfect work on the cross. We're thankful for our small church, a church that loves you, people who honor you. We ask that you would never let us lose sight of the direction of your church and that you're the source and the author. You're the builder and you're the architect. Help us to never get in the way of that, no matter where we go or where we come to. We always want to submit to you, surrender our lives to you, our ideas to you, everything that we are. We're so thankful that you love us. Even in our frailty, Lord, you still love us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we had uh, the chaplain came and used to be uh, <coughs> Dr. Chaplain. And he told us, he said, you know, said, over 30 something years that I've been a chaplain, he said, only maybe a handful, maybe five men came out of there that were really serious about being saved. He said, Brother Dominic and one other, the only two that went into the ministry. But he said, all those years, there's a lot of them that acted like they were saved. And when they left, they changed. They went right back to what he was. So he's telling you, they can't even the truth about that. I shared a little story with you this morning about this message really touched me in a special way this morning because of my brother. My brother's about three years younger than me, and we were the only two left out of five. The rest of them have all passed away. One reason or another, took a couple of the wrecks and things, and one of them was a stroke. But, uh, you know, I, my one next to me, uh, I'm the oldest, and he went off to Emory, and when he got up, he, he raised up in the Baptist church in Thompson, just like I was, first Baptist. He had all the same things I had. He, got baptized three times. You know, he you know, he, he must not have been sure about what it, how he felt, he uncertain, because he kept, got baptized three times. And uh, when he got up to Emory, he got into other people's thinking and religion. <laughs> Next thing I knew, he joined the Unitarian Church. And I, I questioned that, and he said, well, you can kind of believe whatever you want to believe and be in the Unitarian Church. And I said, okay, you know. <laughs> And then the next thing I knew, he got out of that. He got dinner to a young lady who was a Baha'i. I don't know if you ever heard of a Baha'i, but they believe in a man who was from Persia way back in the 1800s called Baha'i'llah. And he got into the Baha'i faith. And uh, this girl, and, they, and he got in that. He's been in it ever, ever since. And uh, he used to argue with him about Christianity, you know, about Jesus and what, what he, you know, what he really believed. And I'd argue with him and argue with him and argue with him. And I finally I got tired of doing it. And one, one day, I said, you know, Ash, I said, I went over to Israel and I saw that tomb where Baha'u'llah was there. He said, yeah. I said, I didn't go in, but I just saw the tomb. And I said, you know, Muhammad was buried over there and he put the tomb over there. There was the hymn over there in the Middle East. And I said, you know, Buddha and all these prophets. I said, they were all buried somewhere. And you tell me that you believe Jesus is just like one of the prophets. Just like one of those prophets. And they're all leaders to God. All these prophets are leaders to God. And that's the way, way he, he, he put Jesus in the category of just another prophet. I said, wait a minute. I said, I'm going to tell you what. I went to the garden tomb where Jesus was buried. And I said, you know what? His bones went in there. The rest of them had bones in them, but his bones were not in there. I had never argued with anybody no more after that. But I'm very concerned about him because I, y'all pray for my brother, his name is Ashman, we call him Ash. But I'm very concerned about him and his family because he's, he's I guess, still involved in all of that Baha'i stuff. And uh, it really concerns me, you know, that he, he never has uh, shown, you know, that he, he believed Jesus is the Son of God. And that's what this message is all about today. And it's, that's just a personal thing. I don't know if you've got family and friends, but 
Dr. Purcell study. I want to thank Ms. Glover this morning for her dedication and her willingness to come and practice and ahead of time and do things that uh, maybe she's special in her tower and I thank her for that. And uh, everybody doesn't practice like she does. She, gets, she won't play a song that she practices before she comes to church. I thank her for that. This morning, let's stand up and turn to 364, standing on the promises. Sing the first and the last. First and last. 364.